Hey, how's it going, everybody? Welcome to the first official episode of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Spock. That's what we're calling this thing that we like to do, where we talk about topics that are interesting to us in the game and hopefully things that are of interest to the community as well. So someone in that community had a great suggestion, which was we should do a Q&A video. So you probably saw um, a community post on each of our channel where we put out a uh, call for questions to be submitted. So I have a whole list of those here and we're gonna make our way through. We'll probably do this in two separate videos so that we're not too rushed and we have a little bit more time to talk about things. Um, so make sure you are subscribed to both channels and hit the like button on this video. Um, and then hit the bell notification thing if you want to be notified of when the next video goes up. Um, but we hope you guys enjoy this. And if the response seems good, we can do something like this again in the future. Um, any thoughts, Jeff? You just excited as I am? Yep, um, this is gonna be interesting. And I guess I'll just preface this by saying I haven't actually looked at any of the questions yet. So the questions from my channel, I moved those over to Mr. Spock and he's compiled them. So I, I will be hearing them first bluff. Yep, that'll be a, a raw take. Um, they're in no order, um, just threw them in based on the order they were submitted. Um, if your question wasn't answered, I apologize about that. We're trying to get through as many as we can, um, but didn't want the video to be too, too long, which is why we're doing the two parts also. So I think without further ado, we'll just jump in here. So first question, um, which I think is a good starting question. Do you guys still enjoy the game? And maybe I'll toss that to you first if you want. Do I still enjoy the game? I, I mean, I'm still playing it every day, so I'm enjoying something about it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the concern that I have with any hobby or thing that I've gotten into my life is I set goals and then I kind of get a little exhausted after I've achieved all those goals. So I'm, I've been struggling with the game with creating goals that will keep me interested and challenges that'll keep me interested. Mm -hmm. uh, I am... I think, and it's from what I understand, a pretty shared experience at this point. I think this year, Small Giant has exhausted us on the game. There's just too much new content, too many 75 floors this, and everybody in the Alliance got to contribute to this. And it's it's been a lot. So it's feeling much more like work than play right now. And that has been uh, a reality that I've been paying attention to. Mm -hmm. um... Yeah, I feel like for myself, or something else I wanted to mention, it, for someone who's very goal oriented like yourself, they're sort of moving the goalposts, right? It's it's they've made it harder, and it's like the field is getting longer. You're running with the ball, and they're just extending the field out, so it's harder to reach some of those places, and and that can definitely cause some burnout. Sure, but the the goals the goals that they set, I find to be not as interesting. <laughs> Like taking a ninja tower and going from 50 floors to 75 and making the floors harder. Yeah. That's not an interesting challenge to me. That just is a way to exhaust more materials and get more money. So mm -hmm. I, I find my personal goals uh, that I set in game much more interesting than what they put out there as, as a game challenge. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's probably good. Um, for myself, I feel like I am still enjoying the game for the, for a long time for me, it's, it's been about trying to find, uh, my balance within that because there's, I didn't want to be at the the top of everything. I found that to be too tiring for myself. Um, so like with our alliance, we try to keep ourselves from climbing too high. Um, so I don't really push in a lot of areas and that makes it more enjoyable for me. Um, but yeah, they, they are pushing a lot. And so the, the answer for me there is like, okay, if they're going to keep doing all this stuff, then I'm just going to have to fall behind a little bit and just be okay with that being the new experience and I don't, I'm not too against that. I wouldn't choose that, um, but you know, I do still enjoy it for the most part, so yeah. Uh, next question, what are your favorite pairings of heroes and why? You mind if I take a shot at this one first? No, go for it. So I've thought about this a lot, you know, synergy has always been kind of a cornerstone of my strategic approach on the channel and, and with most things I do there. And so I've thought about hero pairings a lot. And for me, I really like them to be in the same color. Um, so two that I really like are Freya and Bira together. That healing survivability with also pretty good damage. You got the poison damage every turn and then the boosted minion attack um, is quite strong. And I, I really enjoy that because it's sort of offensive and defensive at the same time. 
Um, I really enjoy Garnet and Black Knight together. Um, ailment protection is so good. A fast heal is really good to have. And if he is shrugging off all this damage, then you're just healing, overhealing the rest of the team um, while he blocks a lot of this. So it's it's a very survivable, survivable pair. And uh, coincidentally, I happen to use those four heroes together on one of my favorite teams pretty often, um, but that may change at some point. So those are, are a couple for me. Do you have any that come straight to mind for you? Sure. I, I don't know. I'm going to use the term pairing loosely because uh, pair usually implies two. So I might go a little more extravagant than two. Sure, right. uh, I think anybody who's followed my gameplay for a while, I, I, f I feel like I use the most basic synergy in the game which is elemental defense down plus defense down and somebody who can smack really hard mm -hmm. and that comes from uh, my background as a challenge event player and a tower player and a mono player uh, i have more i've been looking at expanding my my play options more recently so i've been enjoying what is often referred to as the scotty attack with you know everything to protect scotty so that scotty can go off and wreak havoc right. And now there is with, uh, however, I know we keep going back and forth on this Exnofold or whatever his name is, but him him being paired with Al Freak, uh, th th doing Al Freak attacks. I mean, I, I would have never guessed that under normal war or rating that Al Freak would be a viable offensive weapon being yeah. so very slow. So that's interesting to me. Uh, I know you just, you and I just talked in the last few days and I put the video up about the combination of Ms. Tiro and Garnet. Mm -hmm. And that to me is a really interesting synergy. But before I got into those, uh, the space that I've been really playing in is in what I would call hyper, hyper fast team building. So I have a, a six tile dark team. And it's like when you can get a team to fire in six tiles and it's not a rush event, that's a huge advantage. And frankly, it's just fun. Mm. So I've been really concentrating on some of these six and seven tile teams. So very fast heroes or fast heroes with, you know, level 30 mana troops and mana nodes and everything piled on just to make them super fast. Mm. But that's sort of where I've been playing around right now. And even with those leaning on the same thing you were talking about before of the elemental defense down and defense down if possible, it's just a very reliable way of doing high damage so yeah that's those are some of the classic synergies especially if you can work attack up in there as well the damage really grows exponentially um and yeah that's one that you reminded me of that i really like which is scotty and costume kirill mm -hmm. um, yep that attack down really helps that kind of team survive because it's totally based on scotty doing her thing and that um defense down can counter freya um, and if you guys don't know, basically minions function as an extension of hero HP. And if the hero has increased defense, the minions have increased defense. So Freya's minions are the hardest to kill if you can't counter that defense down because they're pretty uh, chunky and also um, have that increased defense. So mm -hmm. that's Kirill's a great counter for that. And then even you can throw a regular Kirill in there for the attack up and uh, pretty much a reliable five plus stacks every time. See, I love bringing out that team during the minion wars because it's, you know, three yeah, Yesterday was actually the first time I lost a Scotty attack. Even the very first Scotty attack, I, I bumbled through it and still won. And, uh, and I, I lost miserably yesterday with that. I think I had a two, it was a two-point two point oh, war okay. attack. Never good. I think the only time that I've lost to that team, from as far as I can remember, is when I attacked... You know, with the super survivable, everything's built to keep Scotty alive. And I attacked a team with a sniper tank and I didn't get the blues and all the healers that I had with me weren't enough to just keep the, you know, the Kirills go down pretty easily because I don't have them all fully emblemed. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, I typically now try to use that team only against more passive tanks with like hit three or hit all flanks because it weakens the whole team and not, you know, taking out a key hero. Like if Scotty dies, you just might as well flee, you're done for. Yep. Yep. Yeah. All right. This is an interesting one next. Um, so some of these are paraphrased. If, if you recognize this as your question, you know, the wording might be slightly different, but I tried, some of them are quite long. So I tried to shorten them a little bit, um, but still keep the essence of the question intact. Two weeks ago, top alliances started a campaign to stop spending money. Did they realize their goal? You want me to, you want me to jump in first? It don't matter. I'm fine with that either way. Okay. So the thing that struck me about this, 
I, I noticed it and I noticed it in the context of, of one player being like, I placed high and I didn't get any ethers. This is, you know, bull crap, which my response was kind of like, well, you competed for a chance at loot and you got a chance at loot and, you know, you're not the only one that had bad luck on it. Uh, still frustrating. Like I can totally understand that, you know, we've all experienced things like that. And, um, and so, you know, I feel for, for people in that situation, but then there was this response of like, okay, enough's enough. We're going to stop spending, which is something that's happened a lot. But there was no core message of what was desired, what what the outcome people wanted was, and saying we're going to stop spending for two weeks. I mean, small giant is just going to laugh and say, "All right, cool, go for it." You know, they're not going to buckle over two weeks of spending. I don't think they're going to buckle over anything. They've they've proven to be very rigid in their, you know, I, I cringe to use the word morals because that doesn't feel like the right word, but whatever their ideology is about how to run things. They seem extremely steadfast in that. So when it was like, yeah, we're not going to spend for two weeks. And it's like, well, what do you want? And it's like, I don't know. You know, it was like, yeah. So when it says, did they realize the goals? I'm not sure what the goals even were. So I have to say from my perspective, probably not. Um, you know, I, I don't think, I think that the not spending thing has interesting potential. And if it could empower the player base more, I'm all for that. But I, I think it's got to have a clear message and not just be like, we're going to do this for a week and then we're going to start spending again. They're going to be like, all right, have fun. You know, I don't think that's going to accomplish anything. Um, what's what's your perspective? So the super short answer is, did anything change with Small Giant? Yeah. <laughs> Nothing's changed, so I don't think there was any impact. Yeah. Uh, and I appreciate the sentiment, but I have a couple critiques of the movement. Um, first of all, any uh, you know hunger strike or no spending strike or whatever you want to call them, they're not effective when you announce a future start date and a future end date. Yep. Because all that happens, if you're saying next Friday, we're going to all stop spending, then everybody's just going to load up on gems and spend things in advance. And then it's only for two weeks, so or however long. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's something that's easily waited out. Mm -hmm. uh, for a hunger strike to work, you need to stop eating now. You need mm -hmm. to stop spending right now and completely and without an end in sight. Yeah. Uh, so my 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 three critiques: one, they announced a start date in the future, not immediately. Two, they announced an end date, and three. Um, I just lost my thought. So you can't st start date, end date. Um, you have to have full commitment to it. Mm -hmm. And oh my God, I can't believe I lost my th my third thought there. Well, there's got to be a cause. Was that your third thought? What, what well, no, we I mean, I, I get what they were trying to do and they want to, you know, slow down with the cut new content and, uh, you know, the, the the poor rewards and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, oh man, there was a, a logical fallacy in with what they were doing and I completely lost the third point. I'm gonna have to come back to that. Mm -hmm. But you can't, uh, you know, we've seen this uh, in the U.S. years ago. There was something going on with oil, and everybody's like, "All right, for the next two weeks, we're not going to buy any gas. We'll show those oil companies." But everybody just filled their cars up. You know, they conserved gas for two weeks, and then they went right back to using the same amount of fuel. So, like that, those kind of things, I don't think are ever really going to work. Oh, I remember the third thing, the third logical fallacy, um, and this, and and I, you know, I, I don't think I'm one that I really care if I piss people off, but I'm going to to say it plainly. People who talk and do these things have egos. I mean, Mr. Spock has his channel. He has some kind of an ego. I have my channel. We have some kind of ego. We think we're smart. We think we play well. We think we know things about the game. And we know some things and we share some things. But the reality is, if Mr. Spock and I combined our efforts right now and named every player and every alliance we could, it is such a minuscule fraction of the total membership. So mm -hmm. the idea that any of us have the outreach to actually get to uh, a significant mass of players to, to affect change is, I think, nonsensical. I mean, the game's all over the world. I mean, I, I don't know about Mr. Spock. I don't speak any of the Asian languages. I mean, that's just a huge chunk of players I'll never reach. Russia is a massive country. I will never reach the players in Russia. Uh, mm -hmm. So how you unify a game that's worldwide and get a movement to stop spending and then, I mean, we are talking about people who are either addicted or borderline addicted, or at least are tempted to be addicted. Uh, and how many people are going to be lying about not spending when they're saying they're not spending? So, again, I think there's something in the movement, but it's completely structured in a way that I don't think will be successful. Yeah, yeah. Not to say we're opposed to that kind of thing, but yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of problems and considerations around that. 
um, that would need to be addressed. All right, so going a bit lighter next, I kind of like this one. Uh, cards on the table. What do you think of these stories in the Empires and Puzzles campaign? Season one, two, three, four. What do you think of the story? <laughs> the thing that the little thing that animation that plays before and after each stage yeah, with about each province ten words, I, I think after season one i stopped following them or reading them I, I couldn't even i have no idea what the story is anymore yeah i don't follow it enough to be able to say back what it is but there's there's something i like ironically enjoy about it because it's so silly and bad that i like it for that reason and so, uh, spoiler alert here, if you're not into far into season four already, you can cover your ears for a second. Um, but they brought a reference to Ursina back, and I just thought it was so funny in a silly way to be like, well, the greatest crossover in, in a cinematic history. Um, but yeah, cards on the table, the stories are terrible, um, but I find it entertaining for some reason because they're so silly. Yeah, I, I don't find the map portion of the game interesting at all. I think with season four, they finally got to a point where they're changing the effects on each board. So it's a little more interesting to pay attention to which heroes you're going, but I still am. I, I, I think by the time a player is strong enough to get to season four and get through season four, they probably can put teams together to auto farm at least normal uh, and maybe even some of the hard. So yeah. I just, I just find the uh, maps, frankly, exhausting. Yeah, if I could, I would auto farm the entire thing. It, it's, there's nothing. Uh, it's not like you feel accomplished when you finish it. It's more just like, give me the materials at the end. That's all I really want. That, that's not the fun part of the game for me, and it, it never was. <laughs> um, so yeah, OK. So here's a rapid fire round someone submitted. So I guess the answer is quickly as you can. You know, you know, hold on one second. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll just I'll, I'll punctuate that statement with one thing. How many YouTubers out there for the game put up content that are map based? Have you ever, Mr. Spock, put up a video of you doing a map other than testing something? Like, you know, I mean, we go on the map sometimes to test a hero, but um, have you yeah. ever filmed a map for the sake of filming map? No. I, the I, only I, ones I've ever put up is when I try to complete the final stage with like three stars only or four stars. And again, that's what I'm saying about my personal challenges, not one that small giant gives us to it. Yeah. If the maps were interesting, if it was fun, if it was challenging, all of us on YouTube would be putting out videos to show you how to do it. And isn't this cool? Yeah. It's just not interesting content. It's yeah. work. Totally agree. All right. Rapid fire. Coke or Pepsi? <laughs> Coke. Carbonated water. <laughs> um, Kirk or Picard, which is funny. I, I know so little about Star Trek. That's not where the name comes from, which is funny. Everyone thinks I'm a big Star Trek fan. Uh, yeah, don't, <laughs> I don't know about that one. Uh, I don't know the reference, so I can't answer. Uh, Autobots or Decepticons? I never really watched. I believe that's Transformers. Yeah, I'll go Autobots. We'll go for the good guys. PC or Mac? PC. <laughs> I think I would go Mac. I'd been PC for a long time, and there were enough things that annoyed me about it eventually that I just went for the ease of Mac at this point. Um, okay, so here's a good one. I'll, I'll uh, let you jump in on this first. Um, we'll do our best to keep this from being super long-winded, but you know how we are <laughs> if you're watching this video. Favorite three-star, four-star, and five-star heroes. Maybe just the most notable of each or what comes to mind first. Or if you want to think for a second, I, I can jump in first. Three, the favorite three star, four star, five star. To me, it's so situational. It depends on really what I'm doing in the game. I think that, yeah, the question will just be flawed in that way, where it's just kind of like what we end up thinking of and not a, a definitive, well researched list or something. Yeah, I don't know. Are you pulling up the spreadsheets? I'm looking at one of my spreadsheets. Yeah, I'm just looking to see who I who I chose the limit break. Um, but it tends to be people who are most functional. Yeah. I mean, I would say probably the most valuable three star hero, and and people can argue with me about this. I would say is probably Malia. Mm -hmm. uh, fast hit all and critical chance. Mm -hmm. If not her, then Nordry, just because of the uh, elemental defense down. Mm -hmm. But um four stars maybe cillian from the slayers mm -hmm. 
just because that's a, I mean, Sillian is, he's not even a four star. He's a five star that was labeled wrong in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And my favorite five star that changes, you know, I was in love with Jabberwock for a while and then Lepiota has got me going. And then in the last 48 hours, I'd say Miss Tiro is pretty interesting, but uh, none of them are heroes I use regularly. They're just fun to play. Yeah. As the kinds of people we are and the way we think about things, this is probably the hardest question to get because it's like, well, in what context, you know, <laughs> in what period of time? Yeah. It's sort of like the, what's your favorite color question, you know, color for what my favorite color, you know, my favorite color for a shirt is different than my favorite color for a car. And what shade of green, you know, there's right. <laughs> minimal, yeah. I think for myself, three stars really serve no purpose for me except tournaments and then just completing challenge events um, just for the completion rewards. So favorites, I don't think, I think the best answer for me is I don't have any favorite three star heroes because, um, they're just so operational for me and not like, ooh, I got this sweet three-star team here. Um, four stars, to no one's surprise. Uh, my favorites are probably Hansel, Proteus, and Costume Regard. Those have been standbys for me for a long time that I still use um, in a number of capacities. And I just think they're really um, cool offerings at the four-star level. There's, there's a lot of cool four-star heroes now as they expand the capabilities in that class. But to keep the answer short, I think I'll go with those three. Five star heroes. I mean, it seems to me problematic not just to choose the best heroes at the time, right? Because they're super good and they're just better than other heroes. So I don't think there's any any five stars that I can think of off the top of my head that like hold a special place for me. It's about you know how much utility you can um, you can fit into that. So yeah, most of the elite five stars um, I enjoy. I think Ludwig's really cool and there's cool synergies with him. That mana boost is quite unique. And um, But yeah, if you just watch my war videos, you'll see what a lot of my favorite heroes are and you'll hear a lot of discussion around why that is. Okay, is the money you make from YouTube enough to replace a job? What do you think? Well, I, I can be candid with that. You know, and I'll, I guess I'll start this with... Well, first of all, the basic question, replace a job, I guess it depends on your job and how much money you make. Um, uh, what I'm making on YouTube is nowhere near what I'm making professionally. So no, it's not going to replace my job. I do find it interesting. I've been involved in so many communities, community, you know, hobby-based communities, and I've never been in one that has been so money-focused as this group. And I'm yeah. not sure why things come back to money so much in this game. Um and I guess as a pay to play player who's slowing down now on spending, I've always found that as a point of frustration because people always want to come back to that point. But YouTube to me, you know, some months it's four or $500. Sometimes it's 800 to a thousand. Uh, it depends on how much content I'm putting out and how many people are watching it. Uh, you know, I, I Along that lines, I also get frustrated with people like, oh, you just did X, Y, Z to get views or you're just trying to get subscribers. I don't think I've ever promote subscribing or views or, you know, I, I barely look at those numbers. Uh, it's, I guess, mildly interesting to me, but I'm not trying to specifically make a job out of it. Mm -hmm. So something I enjoy, I share the content. I mean, heck, if I was specifically trying to make a living off of YouTube, I'd be making content probably in a different way. Um, I, I put out the content that I like and that I want to put out and maybe people like it as opposed to trying to make content specifically for an audience. Yeah. So it's, it's not been about that for me. Um, the money that I make there, you know, hopefully covers my summons for the months. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that the simplest way to answer it is no, <laughs> it doesn't replace a job. And, and the other thing would be to say that you got to, enjoy it as the hobby first and foremost because um you know for a relatively niche niche subject like this uh game you're not gonna you know you're not gonna buy a private jet or something like that you know like like you said the the money is just not really there at this particular level um it's not nothing you know but it's not like i think just people are really unclear like do you make like 500 dollars per video or something certainly not um so yeah, it's it's uh, it's something that I started doing because I enjoyed it and I like sort of teaching and sharing my experience and it's been really cool to grow it. And now I'm sort of thinking of it differently. I'm like, okay, I wonder what 
I can do with this because it's come, it's become a more central part of uh, what I enjoy doing and what I spend a lot of time on. Um, so shortly after this video, I'm actually going to be launching um, a feature that YouTube has created called memberships where people can um, become a member at different tiers for various extra perks and other types of content and stuff like that. So if you're someone who, you know, sometimes people reach out saying, hey, I think the channel is great. How can I support you? You know, I think this would be a way um, for people who are interested in doing that while also getting um, additional um, value and um, features and whatnot for that money. So if you're interested in that, stay tuned. I'll be announcing that shortly. Um, and that for me is not so I can buy a yacht. That's just to make it not such a time sink that I can that I can keep up with it to the level that I enjoy doing it at. Um, yeah, yeah so. I would also add on to that is, uh, I mean, there's a lot of people making a lot of money on YouTube, but they are not promoting empires and puzzles books information or excuse me empires and puzzles information yeah. uh, the game just does not have a large enough following uh that is getting the kind of subscriber i mean i don't know i don't think there's anybody who's making videos for empires and puzzles that has 100 200 000 subscribers and getting tens of thousands of views uh, i mean the big youtubers are getting hundreds and hundreds of thousands of subscribers and millions of views and none of us are doing that. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, again, uh, as far as replacing a job, it depends on what what standard of living you want. And you know, I, I I think there's some places in the world that I could live on at less than a thousand U.S. a month and probably be okay, but not where I'm living currently. Uh, so that's not going to be happening anytime soon. Yeah. All right. Next question: Who is the better hero, Gravemaker or Clarissa? <laughs> I'll jump in here first. So Clarissa was super highly anticipated. And when she was in beta, people were saying, oh, Gravemaker 2.0, you know, he's got this better element link, slightly better stats, Paladin class, um, et cetera, et cetera. I forget which, I just don't pay any attention to Clarissa anymore. I forget whether they nerfed the upfront damage or the dot damage, um, but Gravemaker is far superior. Um, not in a massive way, but in a way where there's no question about what the answer is for me. So I ascended her. I don't use her ever for anything whatsoever. I really like Gravemaker. I use them all the time. So the difference is minor, but it's significant enough to make the decision crystal clear in my mind who's better. <laughs> I, I laughed when the question was asked because uh... I don't know. It's like, which one is better? It's like asking me like, what are your two least favorite foods and which one's better? Yeah, like yeah. Gra Grave Maker yeah. is I think clearly better than Clarissa, but I'm not interested in either of them. I max both of them. And if I could do undo that, I would do that. I think Grave Maker's time has come and gone. Back in the day when I was uh, recording raid tournament data, Grave Maker was on over 50% of the top five winning teams. And uh, I don't even remember the last time I saw Grave Maker on a defensive team now. Um, I got Grave Maker way too late. And by the time I maxed him and used him, I was just super unenthused. I mean, he hits like a wet noodle and the, the, I'm just not a fan of damage over time. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I, I don't use either of them really for anything. So not a fan. Fair enough. Um, where are we at here? So what are your training camps at and why? And then secondary question to that, what kind of farming is needed to maintain these? Do you want to go first? Do you want me to go first? Um, mine is actually simple. My, my training camps, I have three training camps that are just running TC 11, the, the cheap one. Uh -huh. They just run those nonstop forever. And then, uh, the other, the fourth training camp I have is the Hero Academy, which I am making uh, troops on one level and I'm actually running Hero Academy 10. I started that when they announced costumes. So mm -hmm. I, I wanted to at least get a shot at doing costume Leonidas. And I'm, I'm actually making a long-term video on Hero Academy, seeing how long it takes me to get a hero that's not season one mm -hmm. and then a hero that I don't have. Uh, and I have a, I have a feeling this is going to be a lengthy experience, but, uh, yeah. Spock, you'll probably find this interesting. I'm actually doing the exchange each week and I have a, a running tally on the slide of how much food and time it's costing to make this happen. 
a lot. Yeah, it's obscene. And but yeah, I don't. There's the opportunity cost of when you're running that, you can't use another level in it. So there's yep, that. Exactly. Also. Yeah, I'm hating that now because I used to make uh, the trainer heroes. But yeah. the, the reality is, I'm not. I'm not really leveling heroes anymore. So I don't. I'm not. You know, when I need to level somebody, I go to the training camps, and there's people in there for me to feed. But I, I, I'm, I think I'm beyond needing a, a training camp strategy. Yeah. So to keep mine quick, uh, basically I run two TC11s and two TC2s. I still, I'm basically banking a lot of feeders these days. I like to be able to level a new hero quickly. Um, so that's the, the TC2s. They just turn out a lot more heroes, the one and two stars. Um, and then I've got whatever level it is in the Hero Academy that is making trainer troops. And I've got you know 150 sitting in there as well, uh, just waiting for when I want to use them. Um, and in terms of the farming it takes to accomplish that, I basically farm pretty constantly throughout um, the Atlantis period. It's usually like maybe 40 flasks for me. And that uh, at the level I'm at, which I forget my world energy is maybe like 60 or something, that's enough um, for me to keep those two TC2s going all the time. So. Um, basically just that I feel like it took a while to get to that point for a while. It's just one TC2 and, you know, I was happy to have that. Um, so is the work worth it? It totally depends on how much you're trying to level and how often. Um, but at least that's what goes into it for me. Yeah, uh, I would, I would say that some questions are a little lost on my experience just because of the obsessive amount of farming that I've done. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, and I understand that I'm in a unique place that for the better part of this entire pandemic, my game has been running 20, well, not 24 seven, cause I do sleep, but when I'm awake, the game is auto farming. So yeah. I, I realize most, most, or a lot of players have struggles with like finding enough backpacks and things like that. Like the last time I looked, I had over 160,000 backpacks. So I, it's probably close to 200,000 at this point. Yeah. So those kinds of in-game materials are something that I struggle to relate to just because I've I've obs uh, obsessively farmed. Yeah. So yeah, there's a, a question about that later that I'll that I'll feel to you because I think it, it plays into that experience. Um, this one's a little bit open ended, so um, we'll try to give our quick answers on it. This could be a whole video in and of itself, so <laughs> um, don't want to get too long winded. But with the release of new events and heroes, how can Small Giant balance this hectic calendar? and keep the game from becoming more pay to win? So totally loaded question. Um, you know, there's just a lot to it. What I mean is what I mean by that. Um, so there's no perfect answer, but I guess to give my thoughts real quick. So how can they balance the calendar? I think we're seeing very clearly that they're having trouble with that. So recently they decided we're removing the five old challenge events and putting them all into one place. So that's consolidating five spots on the calendar into one. So we see that room is an issue. Um, obviously spending is lower on those as well. So I think that decision was, was made a bit easier, but yeah, the, the calendar is probably one of their biggest challenges because of how much they're trying to release. And, you know, we still have a lot of overlapping um, significant events at the same time that can make it difficult to get through these. So I, I think it's clear that that is um, an issue for them. And how can they keep the game from becoming more pay to win? I don't think they want to keep it from becoming more pay to win. I feel like it's always been pay, not pay to win. I don't, I don't like that phrase. It didn't say that to me right away, but I don't like that phrase because <laughs> you can't pay to win. You can pay for better chances at it with, you know, better heroes and whatnot, but you can easily lose with the most elite limit broken team in the world against, you know, fairly mediocre teams. It, it, so you can't pay to win. I would say pay to play, like you've said before, is a much better way of thinking about it. But I think they want the game to be pay to play. That's where all their success has come from. You want to progress faster. You want more stuff. You pay for it. And that will always give you an advantage over free to play players. And I think that's important for the stability of the economy. If, if free players have as much as paying players, there's a problem there. You know, um, I think their greed has gotten a bit more unchecked lately. And I don't like that aspect. Um, so I don't see their biggest problem as how to balance paying players with free to play players. Um, I, I see their biggest challenge as how do you keep people from leaving because you're, you're turning them off with just way too much stuff. Um, so yeah, that's what I think about that. Are you familiar in economics with the, the, the term, the point of diminishing returns? 
Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's the, I think that we're we're experiencing the point of diminishing returns with small giant right now. So you're hungry for an ice cream cone. You go out and you buy an ice cream cone and you eat it, and it totally satisfies you because you were so hungry for it. You're like, that was so darn good. I'm going to get another one. Mm -hmm. Well, if you keep that doing that process, at some point you're going to get sick, and the last thing you want to do is have another ice cream cone. It repulses you, and it's just too much. Yeah. So as ridiculous as it is, there is a thing. Uh, about having too much pleasure, about having too much of a good thing. And I think that's what they're doing with saturating the market. One of the things that I really kind of resent right now is that there have been so many new heroes. I'm struggling to keep up with the nuances of what each hero does. I don't even remember, like I look at my, my roster and I'm like, oh, this is a fantastic hero. I don't even remember which event they came from. Like I have to look it up. Where did I even get this person? Yeah. Um, or I'm now seeing heroes that since I'm not pulling as much, I'm seeing heroes I'm not familiar with. And I'm like, who am I even fighting? And to me, that's uh, become overwhelming, not fun. Whereas a year ago, I was super excited about mastering each hero and understanding the nuances as best I can. Mm -hmm. And now it's like, oh, the hell with it. I'm, this, is, this is information overload. I'll, I'll never be able to log all of this data in my brain. I can't even log it into the Excel sheets anymore. Yeah. You know, people, I have long stopped responding. People ask me when the next copy of the Excel's books are coming out. It's like, I can't, <laughs> they need to slow down for me to even try to catch up. Yeah. So I think there's too much going on. I, I do think that in the four plus years of this game, the last year has been distinctly, drastically widening the gap between free to play and pay to play. Uh, I, I think the not giving anyone enough flags to complete the towers is the, the biggest thumbing of the nose to the community that Small Giant could have done in addition to some of the other things that they've done. Uh, and I, I'm somebody who was very pro small giant, you know, a couple of years ago, I was kind of uh, objectively supportive of decisions they were making and tried to rationalize and under it. I remember arguing with people that power creep wasn't really happening because they were doing costumes to make season one relevant. I mean, power creeps out the window now. And uh, yeah, I don't, the money grab I think is awful. And I'm fearing that they're, accelerating their their end <laughs> yeah yeah i think just that that aspect of they want more money but they're getting less money maybe because of that because they're pushing people too much and people are leaving so there is a balance point there between uh you know what it takes to secure the the highest earnings for themselves um so yeah that's a there's a lot to that but let's let's hold that one there sure um, so this one, I'll, I'll ask to you first, since you have a lot more experience with it than I do. How do I level up my troops without spending too much food when I only have one star feeders? So as someone with, you know, much higher developed troops than myself, can you give your perspective on, on that process? I'm sure you've thought about it, like what's the most efficient thing? You know, where am I comfortable being? So it may not be representative for everyone, but it's certainly more information than I would be able to give on my own. Sure. You know, my, my basic troop plan, uh, early on, I started a process where I was feeding one-star troops to two-star troops. So I, I got my built two-star troops for three-star events. So I was doing one to twos, twos to threes, and everything else to uh, four-star troops. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a little food efficient, inefficient at the beginning because you're not going to have all those big troops to feed the other ones. So it's actually kind of stepped. So if I have a brand new four star troop, I will start feeding them one stars until, you know, I get a few levels in and it becomes inefficient and then I'll move up to twos and then somewhere around maybe level 12 or 13 or 14 on a four star. I just feed it pretty much only three and four star troops. Um, that process for me. Uh, I now have all of the two-star troops maxed in the, in the color. I have five attack troops of every color and two defensive troops. So my one stars are, or my two stars are completely done. Mm -hmm. And now I just have thousands of one-star feeders that I, I barely use except to get a new troop started. And uh, now with the level of farming that I'm doing, I'm going back and feeding heavily twos to uh, twos and ones to get them started, but twos to finish them. And that's the three star troops. So I'm now building up a bunch of those. But to me, it's it's a step process. And then you just got to kind of accept that when you get too far that uh, I don't see me spending zillions of food to give one star feeders to a four star troop when they're already, you know, on a higher level. Yeah. 
Yeah, the best advice I can give from my perspective in the way that I've done troops is farm. The more you farm, the more troop feeders you get. And I think Atlantis is the most efficient time to do that. So that's where a lot of my troop feeders come from. You know, save up your tokens for the Ninja Tower um, because you have 5% more chance at four star troops, which are you know obviously the most XP by far. Um, there are trainer troops coming soon. We don't know what that's going to hold yet, so I won't speculate on that. Um, but yeah, you just need to get troop feeders. That's that's the biggest problem for me. So you can do pulls for those if you want to do it without um, spending on that aspect. Then it's really just farming because that's where your feeders are going to come from. So there's there's no trick to it. It's very slow um, for the most part, and uh, and that's just how okay. it looks. I got one piece of advice on troops and I'll, I'll start this by saying there is no joy in feeding troops. It is, a, is a, it's, it's probably lamer than playing the maps, <laughs> but if you want one piece of advice, and this is my strongest piece of advice for troops. If you have five-star heroes that are waiting for mats, stop summoning more heroes. <laughs> Summer in the troops. Uh, if you, you get that itch, I know there's nothing exciting about watching troops pop up. There, you know, there's no super excitement if you get a certain troop, but mm -hmm. all troops are valuable for feeding uh, and they're much cheaper to do a 10 times pull in troops than it is for heroes. And, and there's a lot of you out there that don't need more heroes. Spock does not need more heroes. He has plenty of fives that he's not leveled. I have a zillion fives I have not leveled. Uh, troop pulls. There you have it, folks. All right. Um, I'm going to save a couple of these for the next video because I think these are longer winded and we've gone that way a bit already. Um, I guess this, this could be an interesting one. So besides a red dispeller, what hero type do you think the game currently lacks and is sorely in need of? Anything come to mind or you want me to go while you think about it? One, a red dispeller, two, a red dispeller, and three, a red dispeller. Uh, I know, I think they're good. I, I, I think that's a, a clear need. Um, you know, we have <clears throat> Jot and Ratatoskar and Zenobia and Karnov. So we're missing a, a holy attack tile up booster. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would be interested in that to even that playing field out. Yeah. Yeah, if not often thought about since i don't play mono ever i don't often think about what each color is lacking because i'll just add another color to the team to make up for that um so that way of thinking like how do we make all colors equal in terms of what they offer just hasn't been uh, my philosophy so yeah I, I guess i just don't think about it that way um so that would be my best answer is I personally just want to see more unique heroes and, and not insanely overpowered ones. That's kind of what makes me happy when they add that to the game of like, oh, that's a really clever idea. You can tell someone thought about this and workshopped it to, to make it balanced. And I, that's what kind of excites me um, about, about new heroes. Agreed. More, more Lepiotas and Lord Lokis and, and people who do something creative. Yeah. I do find it interesting when you look across the spectrum of heroes you uh and maybe i just see this because i do the data logging that i do mm -hmm. but there are strange things that i don't understand with small giants rationale with putting heroes together for example i'll just give one because this could get to be a whole video in itself mm -hmm. before dr moreau there was never a hero that wasn't holy that affected accuracy mm -hmm. every hero that affects accuracy is holy and now suddenly dr moreau so why was it always holy and then why is it why is moreau now there yeah. So there, are, and that's just one, but there's a lot of those kind of strange anomalies if you look at the development of their heroes. Yeah, in, in other aspects too, and this connects to something that I think is just an interesting observation. Um, I think a lot of people look at that and think, oh, they're up to something. You know, there's a, there's a deeper motive here. And I don't think that's true. It could be true, I don't know, but I don't think they're as put together as we give them credit for. Like I noticed the other day, I did a video trying to figure out, can minions um, on a sorcerer hero proc the delay effect? Or is it only tile damage and special skills from those heroes that can do that? And I went at it for a long time and did not get it to happen one single time.
but I have noticed that minions can um, can have the jinx effect on them where they deal a little bit of increased damage. And so people are like, oh, they're, you know, they're up to something there. I'm like, I don't think so. I think they just are so focused on what their priorities are that if something's not breaking the game, they don't care. Yeah, they could polish every corner of this kingdom here, but they're not going to because it's the return on that time investment is far less, you know? So I just think that there are blind spots and there are mistakes and resources don't get spent there unless it's a problem. It would be great if they created this amazingly robust, consistent game where everything is intentional and perfectly balanced, but that's just not going to happen. Um, so yeah, it was kind of the same thing when that ether quest came around and they're like, what, why is it blue again? It's not purple. And people are like, oh, let me tell you, they knew that the game wasn't ready for limit broken outbreak. And I'm like, no, oh, they didn't. Like they probably scheduled this five months ago with an algorithm that does a random cycling through and someone screwed something up. Um, and that's what happened. You know, I, I don't think there's always this like sinister where they're laughing in a boardroom with, you know, torches on the wall, like, oh, we got them this time. You know, I think it just they screw up sometimes too. And, and yeah, well. I think I've given them way too much credit for being smart in the past. And when you start to really analyze hero specials with class, yeah. and you realize that there is there's just too many hero specials that don't make sense for the class of hero, mm -hmm. and it's like clearly somebody is they're they're very smart, but they're not that smart. <laughs> And yeah, they, they've started things that they haven't finished before. Like Athena, I think, is the Celestia of ice. Yep. And Hell is the Celestia of something. Where's right. the rest of them, right? Right. Just, yeah, yeah, there's like three of the five of that collection. Yeah. Right. So it's just, it's something they started. And it's not like, oh, we couldn't handle the Holy Celestia. Or you know, it's just like, eh, just didn't pan out. They started working on something else, you know. Um, so yeah, that's probably plenty of elaboration there. So let's do one more question. I think the video is getting pretty long. We might have to do this in more than two parts just because we love to talk and hopefully that's why you <laughs> love watching. But, um, you know, I personally think I may be biased, but I do think there's good value in here. Um, okay, so here's maybe an interesting one to end on based on what we were just talking about. What do we think of them changing the, so you and I, what do we think of them changing the target and nearby function in formations and do we think it was in anticipation for Ludwig? So personally, I don't know. It could be, it could not be. To me, there's not a lot of value in the speculation or at least from my perspective. I think it's kind of an annoying change. It feels like it didn't need to happen and it was a nerf for defenses and offenses. So. You know, if anything, I might believe that it's in preparation for them bringing formations to war or wanting to do more testing on whether this is stable enough uh, to bring to an aspect of the game that I think people really enjoy and put a lot of emphasis on. But um, do I think it was for one specific hero? I don't know. It would have made him ridiculously powerful because the whole team would be charging with that mana effect. But yeah, what, what do you think here? What, what comes up for you on this subject? Um, I would agree. It seems to be an unnecessary, unnecessary change. I think one of the concerns that I have is for fans of the game, they, when they make certain changes, whether it's a nerf or a buff, it actually changes the history of the game. So players might not realize this, but when Athena was first released, there was actually no upper limit to the defense down. Like it just multiplied to a ridiculous level and people were getting like million titan hits so there are players out there that have these massive titan hits on their records they realized how ridiculous it was they nerfed it down so that which is still great i think you can get to negative 65 percent defense down but no one will ever achieve what those players achieved when there was the problem mm -hmm. uh so you know uh, the as far as i know um the highest cup count ever recorded was from quinn from seven days departed and he did that with a specific team during the reign of Gravemaker, Teloria, and Vila. So he had a, a stacked team that he could hold his cups while he had a great team to attack and was able to achieve that. Uh, the second highest cup count, as far as I know, was done by myself, and it was done during raid formations. It was actually the last Sunday of the raid formations when they first tested it, and I had a specific nature hit three team that suddenly was hitting everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, so with that change nobody's going to be able to duplicate what I did or challenge that. And even though I have that, that second 
cup count record as far as I know. I don't like the fact that it's somehow protected now because they nerfed an aspect of the game. Yeah. The, and the other reason I would say that I'm very against that change, and most people I don't think realize it, but it effectively changed how the maps are actually played because there are certain layers of a map where there's a giant boss that's surrounded by many small ones in a circular fashion. And you yeah. used to be able to hit that boss and it would hit everybody. So that feature of the nearbys has a long history in the game of hitting multiple targets, not just three. It's never been a hit three. I use that language, hit three. And I specifically usually use that because I'm talking about the hit three events, like the towers and the challenge events. So yeah. I think that was I think that was a massive mistake uh, to, to, to nerf that. Yeah, and they've created some other problems at the time. So it's like unnecessary to make the change and now they created problems, which is just the mark of a terrible decision. But if you're attacking the um, double formation, the standard double formation, you kill the front row. If you target the center hero in the back, it hits only them. It doesn't hit the heroes that are directly to the side of it. If you attack, so like say you have a hit three hero, you have that back row there. If you hit the center, you hit only them. If you hit the right or the left side, then you hit the side in the center. So they created this weird thing where now these heroes don't even function as they were intended to. <laughs> So they've they've fixed something that didn't need to be fixed and then made something worse in the process. And it's like, come on, guys, this this was not needed. I somewhere the other day I typed I typed a sentence that basically said small giant is great at screwing things up through improvements. <laughs> <laughs> that hits the nail on the head. They they make things worse through their improvements. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we'll hold this uh, part one video here. Um you know, I wasn't sure how it would go. And I think it's a good thing that we have a lot to say about it, but we'll just release it as multiple parts. And then hopefully you guys enjoy that series. And like I mentioned before, um, if we want to, or if you guys want us to, we can do more videos like this in the future. Um, so yeah, thanks for, thanks for joining me today. I think this has been fun. And thank you to whoever suggested um, this idea. All right, excellent. Yeah. Look forward to seeing you in the next one. Yes, so thank you guys so much for watching. Hey, how's it going, everybody? Welcome to the first, oh, wow. <laughs> first official. Take two.